Welcome to another episode of Connect Detrimental. I am Dan Lust. This week, Dan Wallach and Mike Lawson. What's up, guys? How you doing, Dan? Hey, Mike. How's it going, Dan? So, special guest this week, we have Evan Drellick on the podcast. He's our baseball legal guy, for lack of a better term. He's at The Athletic. He's been at the center of a lot of these stories. But mainly why we have him on today is to talk about the release of the Yankees letter. We've been talking about it on the show a bunch. You know, I know uh, we've all done some research into it, seeing what was going to happen after the Second Circuit letter is out. And Evan will tell us if he thinks it's a nothing burger or not. Some uh, dispute as to whether Mike used that term. We know Jeff Passan used that term, friend of the show. But that's it. So we're going to talk Yankees letter with Evan. Before we bring him on, we're going to talk about the Trevor Bauer defamation lawsuit. Certainly big news in the baseball world. And a a topic that we've been circling, this Jerry West looming, it's another defamation suit against the show Winning Time, Adam McKay, the producer, that's the show about the Lakers, the Showtime Lakers in the 80s with Kareem and Magic making a lot of headlines. Okay, before we get started, let me remind everybody this podcast is sponsored by Themis Bar Review, top bar prep company in the entire country. Bar prep is coming up. We have our 3Ls graduating. I know a number of you have reached out. They said they're using Themis. So wish you guys all the best, all of our graduating 3Ls. A home stretch now. You got finals over the next week or two, so good luck with that. And uh, if you're still looking for someone with the bar, get Themis Bar Review. ThemisBar.com forward slash con detrimental. Perfect. Check them out. So let's get started with topic number one. We'll, we'll start with basketball, and then we'll work our way to baseball. Jerry West, people know him now. Uh, you know, he's the logo. He's one of the best basketball players of all time. But if you didn't know anything about him before you watched this show, which I imagine some did not, he's a drunk. He's crying in his underwear. He's screaming at people. He's throwing trophies through windows. You're having John C. Riley look at the camera and say, many people like Jerry West, but they don't know the real story. Here's the real story. So Jerry West, you know, has been doing media this past couple weeks. Quote, the series made us all, the Lakers, look like cartoon characters. They belittled something good. If I have to, I will take this all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, Jerry West is not in New York, so I imagine he means the Supreme Court of the United States, not the New York State Supreme Court, which is our trial court, which is the lowest court. But Dan, let's let's get started on the story. Showtime Lakers, I know a lot of people have been saying there's inaccuracies in the actual plot right? That the Lakers were actually a good team that year, that Elgin Baylor wasn't going to replace Paul Westhead as the coach. A lot of, a lot of different elements of this. But let's start just with Jerry West. You think he has a case here? I think he's going to win this case. I mean, I've read a lot of commentaries that he has this major uphill battle because of the high barriers that have been erected for claims of false invasion, you know, you know defamation and, and defamation per se. But there's some recent case law on it, and we're going to get to that you know, very shortly. But I want to emphasize that when he says the Supreme Court, He might also be referring to the California Supreme Court because this lawsuit is coming. The demand for a retraction letter that was issued a couple of days ago or a week ago essentially is the precursor to the filing of a lawsuit. And that lawsuit will be filed probably in the Central District of California in the same court where another well-known case filed against Netflix that has had some level of success for the plaintiff was filed. And we're going to talk about a name that may not be familiar to many, Nona Gaprindashvili, a grandmaster female chess champion from Russia. She filed a lawsuit against Netflix over the false characterization of her exploits in The Queen's Gambit, you know, which was a purely fictional story about this mythical American, you know, orphan who became this great champion tackling and taking on and beating men and ultimately winning the championship at the Moscow Invitational. The whole thing was a work of fiction, but there was a a little detail in the final episode that favorably compared her exploits to this real person, Nona Gaprindashvili, and said that unlike Nona, this Beth person, the fictional character, actually played against men when that was a total falsity. And that was only one line in one episode of an entire series. And Nona filed a a defamation per se and false light invasion of privacy claim and withstood a motion to dismiss. And her case is moving forward. It's it's going up on appeal. So the recent case law really would tend to support, uh, you know, Jerry West. But let's get back to Jerry West as the human being, anybody who's alive, anybody who's over the age of 15 remembers him as the logo, the logo on the NBA basketball with the National Basketball Association place on its basketball, a person who is an alcoholic, a rageaholic, somebody who threw things and mistreated people. This was one of the most outlandish depictions of a public figure I have ever come across in my 59 years left 59 years on earth. I hope I have 59 years left on earth 
But the notion that a work of fiction can allow one a free license to do whatever they want to a real person and depict them in any manner possible is not supported by the extensive case law in the area of false light and defamation. He wasn't this kind of person. He was a dignified you know, a human being who treated people very well. And, and it's not surprising that this lawyer's demand letter was backed up by about a dozen declarations from people who worked with Jerry West at that time. And at no point was he depicted as anything other than a, a terrific human being who treated everybody with dignity. And even the book the Showtime book on which this dramatization is based doesn't contain any of those cartoonish depictions of Jerry West. To the contrary, the book represents and refers to him as, so, as someone with dignity who treated people respectfully and very well. So there you have it. You might actually have your actual malice based upon the deviation from the book to the dramatization. I could go on. I could spend two hours talking about what a what a travesty this is. And unlike, you know, the, the perception out there in sort of the legal world, I think he's got an exceptionally strong case. And one day, students in law school are going to be reading about West versus HBO, and it's going to transform how the industry treats real life people under the guise of fiction. Well, you, you heard it here first. Dan Wallach confirmed is living until he's 118 years old. Just want to throw that out there. <laughs> it's not going to take 59 years to litigate this. It will take, if it goes the way of the Olivia de Havilland case, which is a similar case in the California court system, it could be five years, 10 years. The, 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 the case could outlive Jerry West. Hopefully it doesn't. But I, I, th- this is an exceptionally strong plaintiff's case, especially... But- under the through the prism of the recent case law developments. And you said you said the the critical word here, right? The burden of proof as a public figure is actual malice. That's what he has to prove for defamation because Jerry West is a public figure. I believe that would be met here to show knowledge or reckless disregard. You have this demand letter pointing at all these false characterizations and HBO basically thumbed its nose at this demand letter and they're going to go forward with season 2 and continue to depict Jerry West as a buffoon. So I think that demand letter could serve a valuable purpose besides hopefully getting a retraction. But if the, if the demand is ignored, then it potentially could serve as the predicate for actual malice and the differences between the treatment in the book versus the treatment in the movie might be enough to show actual malice. You mentioned, Dan, the, the HBO response, which I think is important. You know, the HBO is basically saying this is not a documentary. So I'm just going to paraphrase, but it says HBO has a long history of producing compelling content drawn from actual facts and events that are fictionalized in part for dramatic purposes. Winning Time is not a documentary and has not been presented as such. Dan, I, you know, I don't practice in this space, but I will say, I, I think your, your opinion is in the minority. I think most people don't think there's a case here. I think most people think that HBO is protected. You know, they put up that sign in the beginning based on true events. You know, this is not depict uh, the, what actually happened. I think that's HBO's response. So the question is for a viewer watching this, do they think this is a dr- dramatization or do they think this is a documentary? Because HBO can't retroactively say this is not a documentary. And that can't necessarily cure all their problems. I mentioned it earlier, but Jerry Buss, who's played by John C. Riley, who we know from Step Brothers and Talladega Nights, he speaks to the camera very directly. And he goes, people that don't know Jerry like him. So I'm paraphrasing, but this is the real story. So it, there are shades here where he's I, I, trying to say, I don't know, it does, it's, it's certainly a shade of gray. I don't, I don't think we can say definitively one way or the other, but it's not going to stop Jerry West here. I just had one quote from from also Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, his comments on the situation, because obviously he's depicted here in this in the show as well. But he kind of more brushed it off than than, say, Jerry West. But but I want to quote here. This is from from uh, Kareem's website and his article. He said, it's a shame the way they treat Jerry West, who has openly discussed his struggle with mental health, especially depression, instead of exploring his issues with compassion as a way to better understand the man, they turn him into a wily e. coyote cartoon to be laughed at. He never broke golf clubs. He didn't throw his trophy through the window. Sure. Those actions make dramatic moments, but they reek of facile exploitation of the man rather than exploration of character. Now, even within that he is admitting it's, it's making for a dramatic moment based upon the allegations here and the fact that he's a public figure, he has to show actual malice. I mean, I don't see it. Okay. Well, that's just an element, but let me, let me quote Virginia Phillips, probably the most important quotation among 
any that uh, can come out here. She was the district court judge in the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California that allowed Nona Gaprandashvili's case to proceed on a minor historical factual misrepresentation. It was an important one. It was an important one because it said that she never played men when in fact she did, and that's harmful to her reputation. But that was one small slice of an episode within a seven episode series. What occurred with Jerry West is far more damaging, harmful, and substantial than all the allegations that are contained in the Netflix case uh, where they were sued for misportraying the, the chess champion in the, in the Queen's Gambit. So some quotes from, Ju- from Judge Phillips, which are really worth highlighting here, that this notion that the jury is going to have to debate whether it was real or fiction, that's not the test. I mean, there's no blanket defense for you know, works of fiction. The fact that it's fictional does not insulate the defendant from liability of all the elements from defama- of defamation are present. And here are the critical words in her opinion. She said the test is whether a reasonable person would understand the character to be the person identified and to have the characteristics as described. And she highlighted the fact that the episode referenced real people, real events, and most importantly, identified a real person. And in her mind, this closed the gap between the fictional character and the real life person. And the use of a disclaimer by the broadcast company doesn't act as a sort of a, a force field protecting you know, uh, Netflix from liability. So in the context of HBO, they can, call, they can have that disclaimer in the closing credits and refer to it as a dramatization, but that doesn't negate the possibility and the likelihood that there's a real defamation per se claim here. And I think there's also a false light invasion of privacy. And Dan, I'll let you go in a second. But the reason the chess champion had her false light claim dismissed is because the misrepresentation was about purely public image, you know, her exploits as a chess champion. Obviously, there's no intrusion into her private affairs. By contrast, the Jerry West scenario, they're calling him an alcoholic who's a rageaholic who mistreats people. That's entirely personalized. And not only does that intrude into his private affairs. It's almost entirely about his private affairs and private life. Of course, they insult his acumen as a general manager, but I think he's got a strong false light and defamation per se claim based on the recent uh, interpretations of those doctrines by California courts. Let's move on here. Speaking of California defamation cases, Trevor Bauer is a case that we've covered a lot. So Trevor Bauer tweeted out earlier this week, today I filed a defamation and tortious interference lawsuit against the San Diego woman who falsely accused me of sexual misconduct. I also named one of her attorneys for making knowingly false statements about me to the media. The lawsuit was filed in the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California. This follows with a topic that we did not hit. Trevor Bauer actually sued, uh, you know, the athletic. So he sued the athletic and a reporter for making comments about a skull fracture that he had actually caused a skull fracture. So Bauer now has two defamation cases out there. So we're talking about actual malice. We're talking about, you know, intent to cause harm to someone's character. Bauer's central claim is that this woman made up these causes of action to basically, you know, extort him for money, you know, so we'll, we'll see what, what it bears out. But I just, you know, we talk about on the show, we talk about all these cases, good or bad. Let's not forget here, guys, a, a judge in Bauer's restraining order case ruled, or I don't want to say ruled, but but said in, in no unclear terms that the accuser here made a statement or made statements that lacked credibility. So, you know, when you have the backing of a judge, this this case is not so unforeseeable. But Dan, Mike, I'll, I'll turn it to you. I think, uh, you know, you guys are kind of split on the Jerry West one. What do we feel about Trevor Bauer's defamation case? I'm going to take the opposite side of the prediction I made in Jerry West, Jerry West is going to win this or probably extract a a number of concessions or settlement. I mean, first of all, you have the finding by the court doesn't mean it didn't happen. So there's still truth as a defense. And there's also the damage to the reputation, you know, reputationally, I think Trevor Bowers, you know, image is probably, you know, not at an all time high, which is putting it, you know, mildly, but from a, a real life perspective, getting in front of a jury, but I think he's got a, a, an uphill battle legally, as well as in the court of public opinion, potentially before a jury. 
I definitely have to agree. I think if the fact that, and, and what Dan, what you said that, you know, this woman was denied a permanent restraining order and that's the, the it was a four day hearing in California in LA County and the LA County district attorney's office also f- decided that they weren't going to pursue criminal charges against Trevor Bauer too, which when that came out, we talked about it on the podcast. That it was kind of not necessarily an exoneration, but he's still not playing for the Dodgers and, and his administrative leave keeps getting extended until this is kind of settled. So if, if anything is happening, he's creating more of a problem for himself to actually get back onto the field by putting himself into more lawsuits here with a defamation suit. I, I don't know if there's enough. Again, truth, just because there wasn't enough there. The lawsuits aren't the reason he's on administrative leave. I think where his damage comes into play economically isn't on this contract, but it's on the next contract. He signed a two-year deal, if, if my memory serves me correctly, to pitch for the Dodgers. That deal ends at the end of 2022. What kind of a contract is he, is he going to get in 23, 24, 25, 26? And but for these allegations, maybe there wouldn't have been any problem at all. And he'd be signing a, a Max Scherzer kind of deal and he'd be getting $40 million a year if he pitched at a very high level with the Dodgers. So there is damage here. I just wonder whether you can actually have the provably false element met where you have you have all these photographs and evidence and a classic situation of the victim and the accuser, you know, the classic he said, she said scenario that can create, you know, questions as to what really in fact happened. Maybe only two people really know what happened. And the photographs are going to resonate in a way that just a a, a simple he said, she said, wouldn't be able to carry the day on. So I think he has an uphill battle given the existence of, of these photographs Uh, and maybe some juror sympathy for the victim, or it plays out in the court. I think maybe, are we talking about an actual malice situation because he's a public figure? Is that a higher bar that's now been erected uh, that he's got to clear when in his lawsuit against the athletic? I think he's going to have a difficult time. And to get in front of a a sympathetic jury, I don't know where he's going to find 12 people that haven't heard about this case that don't have a quote unquote negative impression of him. But maybe he has something there and, may, and and given how much wealth he's accumulated, he can bludgeon the other side, you know, in litigation and, and, and extract a settlement. Maybe he's got more skin in the game than the athletic does, which is, you know, they've, they've laid off and, 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 you know, they're having a tight, their economics maybe don't justify spending millions of dollars in a scorched earth litigation. So maybe they do, in fact, settle. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember following this lawsuit closely and there were texts coming from uh, the accuser, secure the bag. And, and the picture that I think Bauer's attorneys have, have done a good job in, in hindsight, right? It's, I think it's another story whether they're going to win their defamation case. But I think they've done a good job as painting like, hey, we're doing everything possible that we can to get Bauer back on the field. He was exonerated by a judicial proceeding. We're now going after you. He, you're going after the athletic for saying these uh, cranial injuries. We're going after, you know, this the person for making up, you know, allegedly making these things up. And the judge, if we're going to look at her state, you know, her ruling at the end of the day said there was a level of consent and that Bauer didn't exceed it. So again, you know, we've been on the show. We've said it a hundred times. You don't have to be a fan of Bauer, but you have to be at some point a fan of due process. And Bauer is, you know, indefinitely being stand, extended on leave. I don't think is the most fair thing in the world. So, you know, I, I do think Bauer and his attorneys and the people around him are doing everything they can. Let's, let's see if it's enough. Let's see if Manfred, uh, you know, wants to uh, wants to lift this and let him back on the field. That said, let us um, let us stick on baseball. We will. Uh, we mentioned at the top, Evan Drellick is our guest today, and we're going to talk about the release of the Yankees letter. Just very quickly, people that don't know the story, we've been following it. You can go back in our archives. But the Yankees, there was a crazy lawsuit. Somebody, a, a fan, a better, a recreational better, sued DraftKings, Major League Baseball, the Red Sox, the Astros, and the Yankees for allegedly covering up sign stealing and saying that it unfairly impacted his betting outcomes or his, his, his performances. So it was kind of a DOA type case. It was a case that got dismissed. It wasn't one that we thought had any credibility, but in the course of that litigation, this quote unquote Yankees letter was, I'm going to say accidentally um, exchanged by major league baseball to the attorneys for this person. So we had this crazy judicial proceeding that proceeded up the appellate courts about whether this letter should be released to the public. So not very normal at all, and which we'll get into with Evan, you know, Evan is a writer for The Athletic, uh, and he's been covering this since day one. So we thought he was probably the best person to cover this in, in all the ins and outs. So with that said, let us kick it over to Evan Drell. Evan, welcome back to Conic Detrimental. It's been a while. Thanks, Dan. How are you doing? 
like two passion ships in the night. We've been trying to find a topic for you to come back on. And wouldn't you know, Evan, you're at the epicenter of this Yankees letter release. Now, I've been hyping it up. The letter is finally out. Mike has been on the record as saying that this letter would be a, quote, nothing burger. So I will give it to you, Evan. You have the floor. What do we have from the release of this infamous Yankees letter that is now out? I'd like to understand the um, the province of of nothing burger because I, I too have seen this. I think Jeff Passan used it. And I think I had some colleagues at the athletic text it to me. When did this become the word and how did it get so closely associated with the Yankees letter? It, it just, I don't remember people describing that other things in my life as nothing burgers. I guess I've heard it before. Look, if the question is, does this reveal a level of cheating that we didn't previously understand the Yankees to have undertaken or anything comparable to what the Astros were doing with their real-time garbage can center field camera system? No, it doesn't. And so in that respect, I think that's what most people mean when they say it's nothing burger. You know, the letter isn't revelatory. It, it was revelatory to me in other ways in that it does show a distinct difference between what Rob Manfred explained of what was going on publicly. If you go back and look at what he said in a September 2017 statement, statement slash press release, the whole press release was just his statement and compare it to what's in the letter. You know, the the statement at the time really does not make clear what the Yankees were doing. You know, if you you did a basic exercise and handed it to somebody, the, the statement from 2017 that was publicly released said, tell me what the Yankees were up to. I think you'd have a lot of confusion and a lot of guessing. It's just not clear. The letter makes it much clearer that there was a material violation and what they were doing with the dugout phone. So the letter to me is still an important document. It, it is not something that you should just be waved off. If you have an interest in the way electronic science stealing progressed and the commissioner's decisions and all that, if the only interest you have is did the Yankees cheat the way the Astros did? No. And we, you know, Ken Rosenthal and I at the athletic, I believe were the first to tell you what the Yankees were doing. We reported that back in 2020, which again shows the the press release that the Yankees that, that MLB put out in 2017 didn't explain what was going on. It was just not clear. It was, I don't want to say entirely sweeping the issue under the rug, but partially it, it was. Yeah. Evan, we have some late breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> I have discovered the origin of the use of the word nothing burger. Yeah. Are you guys ready? Yeah. The nothing That's... burger is often attributed to a 1950s gossip columnist named Luella Parsons. Beginning in 1953, Parsons used the term in a number of columns to refer to minor celebrities she deemed unworthy of public attention. Is this letter huh. unworthy of public attention? Yeah, I, look, I wrote a column and good sleuthing there on the definition. I wrote a column right after the letter came out on Tuesday, you know, explaining how I look at it and, and what we can kind of glean from the letter. And, and you know, you really got to kind of go back through where baseball was at the time. But you wanted us to be quick here. So that's my answer is yes is is or no. It is that it is not entirely a nothing burger, whatever, however you phrase the question. I think it would have been a nothing burger. Had the Yankees yeah. just let the matter, you know, lie and didn't, you know, build a, a nothing burger into a double cheeseburger with lettuce, tomato, you know, bacon, onion, mushrooms, and, and, and egg white. They made it into something when it was actually nothing. And I wonder what they gained from this in the long run, because the public relations, and you've probably written about this, but the public relations hit that they're taking from uh, amplifying the issue probably greatly exceeds what they would have sustained had it just been one of those let it lie and we'll defend ourselves if we have to, but they made it into a front page story. I think they probably drew more attention to it. I do think even in a world, like what, what would be the opposite of what they did where they simply didn't fight the release of it and it comes out in 2020. And back then, remember, we were still pretty fresh off of, uh, of everything. I think the substance of the letter as it compares to what MLB explained in its press release still would be to those who have interest in the topic on that level, you know, relevant, right? I, I don't I don't think this was entirely a creation of the Yankees' own theatrics and Randy Levine's desire, you know, Levine arguing on, on behalf of the Yankees himself. And then, you know, the final appeal to the, to the Second Circuit for the rehearing 
if you if you look at it, I believe it's not signed by outside counsel. It's just Randy Levine, right? It's, it's just uh, the Yankees trying to defend the Yankees to the Second Circuit, which is not even though Randy Levine is a lawyer who can do that, it's it's not a common thing to go without outside counsel there. I think everybody was clear that the letter was different than the statement, and and they wanted to keep it from from getting out. I think that's the ultimate question that most people had, though, is is why, especially in you've written about this. And for those who unless you're living under a rock, Evan Drellick, he writes for The Athletic. I, I highly suggest go reading all of his articles on the from the beginning of this appeal process with the Yankees letter through the release of it. But your articles were kind of properly laying out where the judges were even saying like. 90% of this letter is already public knowledge. So right. why are the Yankees fighting for it? And I, we talked about this on prior podcasts where I was like, are they protecting major league baseball? Is major league baseball worried about this? Are we worried about, and then the latest article, once it came out and what you're saying here is this is more damning to major league baseball with how they handled the situation. So what was the purpose of Randy Levine and the Yankees fighting for this to maintain their, their seal? I think it's a few things. One is, and, and I see this even in my Twitter mentions after the column, and I, look, I see it in my Twitter mentions frequently, is you can't expect the general public to always comprehend the nuance with these sign stealing situations, right? If if there's a letter that says the Yankees were stealing signs, which is, which is it, that's not inaccurate. That is what the letter says. There's a lot more to understand about the differences between what the Astros are doing, what the Yankees are doing. But they know that, the, that not everybody's going to take the time to really dig in on this and grasp it. And so there is going to be an inherent hit there where some, somebody's going to say, okay, letter says the Yankees are stealing signs. So what's the difference between them and the Astros? You know, there was a reasonable concern there. But also, you know, again, you know what is that big difference between what MLB said in 2017 and since then and what – this private letter to Brian Cashman says it is an official document saying the Yankees stole signs. Right? That doesn't, I, I don't remember Rob Manfred saying that subsequent to that letter in 2017, right? Even if it is not as egregious as what the Astros were doing, even if it is at a time period that Rob Manfred is saying, well, this wasn't violating the rules, which, which is what I wrote about is really the whole crux of the thing. It still is saying something significant, right? That, that, an official body at Major League Baseball had not said before, yes, the Yankees were stealing signs in their video room uh, in that era. We knew it because we reported it at The Athletic and then other outlets reported it as well. It's been known, but Major League Baseball hasn't said it, right? They didn't want to admit it. It's something they wanted to, they wanted this to go away, right? That was the whole purpose of how they orchestrated the fine for the Red Sox, the fine for the Yankees. And, you know, the, the, this September 2017 decision-making by Rob Manfred and the people at the commissioner's office is really crucial in, in the history. I think the history of the sport overall, because this electronic sign stealing episode, you know, is, is something of a chapter in the sport, right? It, it, by deciding that the Yankees did not violate the rules by doing something in their video room, right? That's the decision. It's that the Yankees and the Red Sox were not guilty of something in their video room. He was going to treat that as a, as a crime going forward, but not at that point. That's an interpretation, right? There was a very broad rule, but there was a rule that said you can't use electronic equipment to steal signs. That's what that's I'm paraphrasing, but that's what the rule said. And he and he didn't apply that rule to this situation. That's a pretty significant choice because the purpose, and I asked him this at the time at Fenway Park in 2017, what's the purpose of the punishment? And he talked about deterrence. He did not deter the Red Sox from cheating the next year. He did not deter the Astros from continuing to cheat inside of that same year or the next year, right? They didn't continue the garbage can, but they were still using the space runner method that the 15 and 16 Yankees were using. So Manfred's decision to say Yankees, Red Sox, you're fine to use your video rooms to decode signs. I'm just going to treat it as a crime going forward. Well, what if he decides the other way? Do you scare off the Astros from cheating? Do you effectively end the problem if you are more aggressive and harsh in 2017. So all of this, I guess, is to explain why I think there's a lot more attached to it than simply this question of, well, did it show they were doing what the Astros were doing? This is a big decision, and it is not a nothing burger 
I like Just burgers. One follow up on that, Evan. I, I yeah. think Mike, you might need to respond to the nothing burger comment. That was your; those were your words. I didn't say nothing burger. That was not me. I, I said there was. I'm nothing not taking a shot it. at pass either. Love you, Joe. In your article on the 21st, uh, April 21st, after the Yankees lost on the appeal, the letter was was going to be released. Yeah. Uh, there was the rumors of the Supreme Court appeal uh, pushing the stay, you know, up to the Supreme Court, and I, I think your article said that. That, you know, you had a source that said that they weren't going to do that or they weren't thinking about that. Was there ever a point where they actually were or thought about bringing this to the Supreme Court to maintain the seal of this letter? I can't definitively answer that. I, I, I think they must have. I imagine they realized it, the fact that the petition for the on bank rehearing is only signed by Randy Levine, I think, suggests that they understood it was a long shot to begin with. And they're smart people who have smart enough outside counsel, they know that the on, on bank rehearing is, you know, virtually no chance. I, I, t- I talked to someone when they filed that petition or right before it, who, who you know, has some familiar, familiarity with the second circuit. And they, they told me this is no chance. Right? This wasn't somebody who, who was in a position to go on the record with this type of analysis, but it was very clear that it was not going to go anywhere. Right. So what's, I mean, you're just wasting the court's time if you're the Yankees. And, and well, it's the Supreme uh, Court's limited jurisdiction. They take less than 40 cases a year for oral yeah, arguments. Right. It, it's, it's, I, I mean, signal national importance. Less than 1% of petitions are granted. And they're going to they're gonna grant a petition from not a law firm, but from Randy Levine on an issue that's really a, of only limited importance just to, you know, say, salvage the Yankees, you know, pride, so to speak. That wouldn't have even gotten on the radar. I don't see the issue there. That would even yeah. be tempting to the Supreme Court. Right. And I guess give the Yankees, you know, I, I, it would be a question that I don't know the answer to. Maybe you guys, more legal experts, would know the answer to. Would there have been a downside to the Yankees making that, right? To, to, to have made a petition for cert, like, does that hurt the Yankees if they, if they do something so kind of obviously dumb? Scorn, or, or- scorn from lawyers. Yeah, or yeah, from a legal community. I mean, yeah. here's here's the the downside, and maybe the the reason I don't think, I don't know, I don't think we can call this a nothing burger, right? And that's uh, Evan. I'm on your side, Mike. Yeah, you shouldn't have used that term. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna look no, at the paper. opinions. You know, we're, we're, he gave us content, all, yeah. all for yeah. content. He might not have said that exactly, but that was the implication. He said we knew everything already. But here's, yeah. here's no, we did. But that part is but, true. That part is here's, true. Here's where I think that the Yankees optically, right? Why the Astros are Astros fans are going crazy on Twitter and saying we got them and you know, like you guys cheated and you still couldn't win a, you know, win at the flag. So I, I think the optics of the Yankees challenging this and hiding this, if it really, if everybody knew it and if everyone was reading your columns, right? Like, I don't know, why, why is everyone fighting so hard? I mean, why are the Yankees fighting so hard to protect it? So I think the Yankees trying to take this to the Supreme Court of the United States just would have looked really stupid. And the fact that this, that this letter comes out and the Yankees are fighting so hard to do it, right? Mike, you, you alluded to it. We talked about it on a prior episode. Evan, correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I think I got this from you, that this Yankees letter was actually released by Major League Baseball's lawyers by accident, that they actually, in the middle of discovery, they gave this to the plaintiff in that drafting suit. So that that was in the heart of all of this, that the Yankees were kind of pissed at Major League Baseball for disclosing the Yankees letter, which... You know, I don't, I'm not aware of a version of a Red Sox letter or, a, you know, I don't want to get anybody mad at me, but like a Detroit Tigers letter or a St. Louis Cardinals letter. The Yankees were the only team that was put on blast. So, you know, can you speak at all to Major League Baseball's gaff here? Is there any bad blood? I, I You know, I feel like that part's been underreported that Major League Baseball made a mistake here. Yeah, well, so it wasn't until I believe, uh, unless I missed something, it, the final appeal the petition for the rehearing of the second circuit that randy levine makes incredibly clear we think mlb screwed up if you look at an earlier filing i believe once it had reached the second circuit i think levine yeah and one of the briefs submitted to the second circuit calls it happenstance says that the the letter was submitted by happenstance so he's kind of he's kind of trying to lead you there at that point that it was a mistake by mlb but that that is the allegation that the Yankees levied against MLB. And I did think it was, and it, you know, I, I kind of, I did actually look, it was the one curiosity I had that day was whether any other outlet was, you know, any other reporter kind of pick up on this. It's like, it Oh, that's not- interesting. You have MLB. Yeah. You know, the Yankees pointing a finger at MLB, but that's what they were doing. You know? And I do think that is interesting there. I don't think that means that the relationship between MLB and the Yankees is uh, permanently fractured, but yeah, 
the the Yankee I mean, that was part of the Yankees argument all along is that they were not a, uh, you know they were not a, originally a party to the lawsuit the lawsuit was filed against the Astros the Red Sox Major League Baseball if I remember properly you know that was the Yankees you know when Randy Levine says you know it's going to cause problems down the road that's what he's arguing is that by allowing a letter that's related to a party that was not in the lawsuit to be to come out at the end of this is unfair and it'll set a bad precedent yada yada Last one here for you, Evan, before we let you go. You mentioned before that this is now an era of baseball, the sign-stealing scandal, the sign-stealing saga, whatever you want to call it. How would you or could you make a comparison between the way that Bud Selig handled the steroid era and the way that Rob Manfred, who was under Bud Selig the whole time, uh, has handled the sign-stealing scandal? Yeah, the, you know, the, the parallels are pretty easy to, to draw they didn't address the problem until it was too late. I think it's the, the top line observation. It becomes a PR crisis management, kind of trying to limit the damage. You know, I, it, it, with PEDs, you have the Mitchell report. There, there has not been an equivalent of that. I'm not saying there should be with electronic sign stealing. And, you know, the, kind of the one difference between the two is you had this public health concern. You had Congress really, we, we have had politicians speak out about sign stealing. Uh, and at one point, I believe there was a, a congressman who was even threatening, you know, a, a special hearing about it. But, you know, there, there was a whole other public health layer, right? So th- there was greater public pressure. And so then MLB had to try to clean it up. But, you know, th- that's exactly what happened with science stealing is they had a problem. They started to discover it. What this September 2017 letter and, and everything that happened in September 2017 represents is really the first encounter, right? This is the moment where Rob Manfred has a chance to kind of stem the tide, you know, bring it to light, push it under the rug, right? And he, and he makes a series of choices about how he's going to interpret the rules, what he's going to punish, what he's not going to punish. And I think in hindsight, and he admitted this, you know, Ken Rosenthal and I talked to Rob in 2020, I, I could find the link, where Ma- Rob says, I regret, you know, not getting out in front of the video room stuff sooner. You know, he, he admits that that was a mistake. And I think that was a, an important admission and an obvious admission, you know, and, and I guess that would be my kind of takeaway for people with, with this letter. Like, yeah, if you're just asking that question about, is it as bad as the Astros? No, it, it, it does not reveal that. Does this letter have relevance to what happens afterward in the sports history? Yeah, it, it does because it, it it's an insight into a decision-making process that led us to something that we're still talking about five years later you know it's it's kind of remarkable that here we are still discussing electronic science science i think that's exactly when i read your article that was actually where my first mind went was how bud Selig handled the steroid era because of what you said and you said it here today too with like the fact that he made a choice he made a decision that he was going to kind of create this precedent and then in order to, because he, I have to believe that there, like Dan said, that there's other letters, there's to other teams in this internal. No, there are. They're definitely they're the letters. The other letters exist. Yes, every time there's an investigation like that, Astros get a letter, right? Right. Wait, can we stop on this particular point? This, this is this is very big, and then we'll have and we'll get you out of here. But here, here's the thing: where like I, I think everyone needs to take a step in a, a second and stop. This was not a case about the release of the letter. It was a case about like you know, the MLB covering up sign stealing and influencing the results of games. Like the fact that this made it up all the way on appeal to second circuit, the release of a, the Yankees letter is bizarre, right? It, it's not, it's not really a normal pre-procedural posture of the case. So I think the Yankees were right. There, there wasn't, I read it in your reporting as well, that the Yankees, you know, maybe, may, I mean, maybe the commentary was, you know, that the Yankees are one of these premier franchises in major league baseball. And that's why they're, you know, being kind of left out to dry, but you know, it, you'd be remiss if you didn't see all the comments on social media saying every team had some type of sign stealing system, right? And Major League Baseball was looking at this. They put out that memo, I think, in 2017 that said no more using technology to steal signs. Like it obviously wasn't just the Red Sox, the Yankees and the Astros. But, you know, that's a, a possible conclusion from this Yankees letter. Oh, the only three that cheated were those three teams, which I, I don't think is fair, but I'm seeing it a lot. Like those are the only confirmed cheaters, which you know, I, we just, it's not, it's not the case. We don't know that. We can't just say because we have these three that there's nobody else. No, that, that's, that's right. I think it's a reasonable belief that other teams were doing the video room method. So doing what the Yankees were doing, you know, using the, the video replay system to break down signs and getting it out to the runner. Right. And that's something the Astros did something the Red Sox did. 
the, the problem, it, it is also very easy for people, and we hear players do this, and it, and it I don't want to say drives me crazy, but it, it's funny how people latch on to, well, everybody was doing it. Hold up, hold up. It's, it's very easy to say that and then just walk away from it, right? I don't think that was the case, that everybody was doing it. I think what we know and understand is that veteran teams starting in 2015, maybe as early as 2014, but so certainly we know in 2015 that the Yankees, started doing this and then word started to spread. So it goes from New York to Boston. It gets to Houston. It wouldn't surprise me if, if some other solid teams, experienced teams were doing it as well. Does that mean the entire league? Does that even mean half the league? I don't know. Right. And, and there, you know, in the reporting process and it, it, there was a burden for us to find people with firsthand knowledge of what happened. And that's, you know, proudly what separated the reporting Ken and I did from other people is we didn't have people going, I think those guys are cheating. We had people saying, Hey, we were cheating. You know how we know I was the one doing it. Right. And we had that on the Astros. We had on the Red Sox and we had on the Yankees. And that's kind of what you need. You know, I, I think it's fair to assume other teams were, were doing video room stuff, not what the Astros were doing. We're doing some video room stuff, but how many, you know, you just, you don't know what you don't know, but you can also take that too far to where you're like, well, the, the, none of these people have culpability or, or deserve punishment. And it doesn't make sense to me. Just because just somebody else is driving 110 doesn't mean you can drive 110 or 90, right? Uh, so there's a lot of discussions off of this that can be had. Something tells me that uh, similar to the Mike Fires bombshell, that uh, the story of sign stealing is not yet over. It is 2022. Some players will retire and maybe they'll write a book and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give you some more fodder. Evan, our pleasure to have you on the show. And yeah, uh, hopefully we get you back on uh, sometime soon, some baseball on the wall. Thanks, guys. You know, there's never a shortage of baseball legal issues. So uh, I think we'll see you very soon, Evan. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Evan. Absolutely. So that was Evan Drellick. Uh, he is on Twitter at Evan Drellick, D-R-E-L-L-I-C-H. So Evan is a, is a world of information. Definitely check out The Athletic if you're not already. Okay, so we are recording this on Wednesday. Tomorrow is the NFL Draft. And a uh, reminder, the podcast is also sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. Football season is right around the corner. You can play baseball. You can play their Battle Royale, which I have been dipping my toe into. But yeah, check out Underdog Fantasy. Use our promo code CONDUCT for all sorts of deals. But Dan, let me, let me turn it over to you. We had a question that, that we're, was posed to us online. Why in New York, that's where, where I am and where one of our, uh, one of our friends was uh, in New York, you cannot bet on the NFL draft in New York. So I'll, I'll give it to you, the sports betting guru. Why is that? Well, New York's definition of you know, sports wagering makes crystal clear that you can only bet on athletic contests. And that's the reason why you see a patchwork of how states treat the NFL draft. In some states, you can bet on it. And in other states, you can't. And the reason is because how the state legislatures define what it is that you can bet on. And it's the legislature's choice in New York and a bunch of other states, such as Connecticut, Iowa, Mississippi, to name a few examples, that sports wagering can only be on athletic contests or sporting events. And the way those are defined in those statutes necessarily exclude something like the NFL draft or an award show. Whereas in states like New Jersey and Nevada, there's a little bit more flexibility built into the statutory regime, and they do allow limited wagering on the NFL draft. I think in, in, in New Jersey, there are limits on the timing of when the betting has to stop, whether it can be in the first round, or I think Nevada has a cutoff of one day before the first round begins. So there are lower limits, and there are certain guardrails put in place, largely because there's a real high risk of insider information being misused. It's not just Adam Schefter going around, but it's thousands of staffers and media members that have access to information that, you, that the general public doesn't have. So that's really it in a nutshell, Dan. So maybe in a year or two, but it's going to require a legislative change. I guess that'll put this episode in the books. Just, I guess we can shout her out. Katie Mox over at MSG was the one that posed that question to us. She's a sports betting analyst, we'll say, and a host on MSG. Um, okay. So yeah, that'll end it. And for Dan, myself, Mike, we will see you next time on another episode of Conor Detrimental.